Thank you. Hey, so I thought that was pretty amazing. Um, I think we learned a lot. I'd love to introduce you to our next guest. Our next guest, guest is Professor um, Lionel, um, Chair of Electrical Engineering at Oxford University and Director of Oxford Institute for Biomedical Engineering. Lionel, come on on. So um, this is great. So we're live here at the conference. The conference is going on. I have some amazing guests. So they'll be walking in and out. And this is what happens when you do a live conference. <laughs> uh, Lionel, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. So when did you fly in? I flew in yesterday, uh, Sunday. It was like okay. two days ago, yes. How was the weather in, in London when you left? Well, if I, I've, I spent a bit of time in the Bay Area okay. meeting some of these wireless sensor companies. So I'll actually be in the U.S. for a week. And it was so but but the, the weather wasn't too bad. We had a bit of what I call an Indian summer in the U.K. when, when the temperature rises above yep. 60. Yep. <laughs> to me, you know, I used to have an office in London. And I spent a lot of time in London. And any time I was there for three or four days and it didn't rain, it was like the greatest. It's Absolutely. still one of my the greatest <laughs> cities ever. We it's had a great Olympics. Yes, you, you did an amazing <laughs> job with the Olympics. Hey, so my first question, please introduce yourself and tell our listeners about your role at Oxford University and the Oxford Institute of Biomedical Engineering. Okay, so I'm the chair of electrical engineering, been the chair of electrical engineering for the last 15 years, and I've been interested in monitoring what we call safety critical systems. So I've worked a lot with jet engines, okay. Rolls Royce, um, the engine that is going on the Boeing Dreamliner, so which is the Trent 1000, uh -huh. for example, involved in uh, designing the engine health monitoring systems. I've done a lot of um, patient monitoring in hospital, right? and I've been in the kind of uh, chronic disease M health space in the last five years or so. Um, during that time, we've set up the Institute of Biomedical Engineering, and it's very interesting. I think similar to a lot of institutes maybe on U.S. campuses, it's actually a bunch of engineers, 200 of us, on the medical campus. So we spend more time with physicians wow. than we do with engineers, which is very important. Wow. That's, so, so with that role, you obviously see a lot of exciting and new initiatives you know, what are some of the new ones coming out of Oxford, especially in the M Health space? Well, we, we, one of the reasons for working with clinicians, and I think it's a requirement the world over, but it is especially acute in the UK, is clinical trial evidence. Right. I think you talked with your previous speaker about yep. how do you convince people. Well, I think you've got two sets of people to convince. You've got the physicians, uh -huh. and you've got to convince the patients. Now, to convince the physicians, you need clinical trial ev evidence. Uh, now, the highest grade of evidence is the randomized control trial. It can be quite difficult to do in hem health, but we spend a lot of time and energy doing these trials of these new technologies because to us, that's the way that we're going to get the dieting Thomases on board. I, I think that's me. So um, the C besides being the host of the M health right. Zone, I'm the CEO of a company called Haptic, and we're all about cur curating apps, certifying apps, mm -hmm. and prescribing apps. And one of the things that's most interesting to me about the space is there isn't a lot of data out there. Mm -hmm. no, people are creating great data technologies. Absolutely. They're creating great devices, great apps, and the bandwidth is here, you know, the whole infrastructure, but no one's really go, or at least I don't see it as much as I, sh I wish I did, going after the data. Where yeah. are the clinical trials? We, common sense wise, we go, if a patient uses this, chances are they're going to adhere to their app, or, you know, to their medication, or they wouldn't adhere to it. If they do this, chances are they're going to be healthier. What do you think one of the reasons why there hasn't been a lot of data collected in this space? Because it's d difficult to do these clinical trials because you're not just doing a drug, placebo versus right. drug. You're doing the technology, not just doing the technology, the way the patient uses it, the way the physician uses it, the whole intervention protocol. Right. It actually takes time and energy, but that's one of our prime drives in Oxford, one of our prime focus. So I've done 18 clinical trials in wow. the last six years of M Health technology. So you have this data. You know what, what works and doesn't work. All right, so we have to talk offline because okay. I'm looking for this data everywhere. And I noticed in 2005, you won the eHealth Innovation Award for Best Device to Empower Patients. So first off, tell us about a, um, the award-winning device. And second, on my side, there was an eHealth Award in 2005. I was under the total impression that mobile health didn't really exist before 2010. Like my iPad didn't mm -hmm. exist before 2009. Mm -hmm. Good point. Maybe slight precursors, and yep. maybe the first one to win that award. <laughs> um, because you're right, it's when um, a GPRS 3G yep. w was turned on 2002, 2003, and we Kay. were precursors of putting uh, technology on the phone, linking it to devices such as a blood sugar meter, via right. Bluetooth, etc. And we were the first people to do that, and I think that's the reason why we won the award. We, and But what thing that it did teach me is that there is another player in all of this. It's the patient or the individual, right. and you have to involve them. I'll give you a very simple example, text messages for motivational purposes. Right. So we had text messages for our type 1 diabetes patients about when they should be doing their blood sugar readings and so on. 
98% of them came back to us. Turn them off. I know I've got diabetes. I know I should be doing my blood sugars. I don't want it to be don't reminded remind all the time. It. Leave me alone. I know what I've got to do. Now we're doing a gestational diabetes app. This is women who get uh, diabetes during pregnancy. This is new to them. Uh -huh. They'll get it for about 12 weeks or so. They know that they've got to manage themselves properly for their sake, for the sake of their babies. Uh, but it's new to them. The more text messages we can send them to remind them what to do when, the yeah. happier they are. Because they're hungry for this kind Absolutely. So you have to understand the individual yep. psychology to empower them. That's right. really the lesson that right. award. Some apps aren't forever. Some apps are disposable apps. It's, you know, it's really interesting you say this. So what you were doing in 2005, 2006, 2007, there's companies that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars in this ML space who are just trying to do that now. Mm -hmm. So sitting back, do you find it kind of funny that, you know, a diabetes adherence app is popping up and it raised $10, $15 million. And uh, this app, the, it you, you could be right. It could be because the data isn't published or, or the, the, the guys who, who are raising the money are not looking in the right journals. There is data out there about how this works. And one of the things which is very clear is that if you put an app out there and right. you have an intervention protocol and it's going to take three to six months to stabilize yep. the patient's on, you'll get perfect compliance. The hard thing to do is going beyond the six months. Right. That is really hard. We all seem to be right. quite easy to motivate to do something right. extra, to do something new even for our health, but three to six months. Beyond that, you have to be smart about what you do to keep the, the patient, right. the individual involved. Oh. Yeah, and, and no, no two patients need are to be same. are exactly the same. So everyone needs to be done. And then the other side is, hey, if someone does something for 90 or 120 days, do they need an app reminding them every day? Very good point. Absolutely. I, I mean, I've done all the foods apps, and I, I wear Nike Fuel. And <laughs> I, what I've learned from my, my um, all my sites is that hey, a shot of tequila has 120 calories, mm -hmm. and after I put that information in five or six times, I remember that. I know, you know. So part is it's changing how you. Yes, but there is a paradox here, which I don't think has been pointed at the right. conference here, which I think would be very interesting to discuss. Is guy like you who uh -huh. really wants to know about uh -huh. carbohydrates on you're great and you'll learn and etc yeah. but in some ways where m health is going to deliver economic returns Everyone is on the elderly them. patients with yep. heart failure yep. with copd with advanced diabetes etc yep. and they're the people who don't want to do what you're doing right. so there's this real dichotomy right. the people that you want to do it, or people like me who know about my fitness and uh -huh. so we're fine but really where you're going to have the economic impact in reducing unscheduled yep. hospital admissions etc are on a sector where it's very, very hard to motivate these people right. to do that kind of thing. Do, do you find, I'm personally speaking, do you find it easier in the UK where there's a single payer, where in the US it's not just the government involved, there's the Etnas, the Signers, the United, there's so many different um, players involved to make change moving into mHealth? I think people the world over are the same. Okay. So psychology is the same. There may be some things that's slightly easier to do in the socialized medicine, uh, but really you have to understand an individual psychology and whether you're in the US yep. or the UK your psychology if you've got diabetes and have had it for the last 20 years is probably going to be similar in both countries absolutely All right. I got two more questions for okay. you you're giving a, um, a, a talk this afternoon keynote about delivering improved outcomes for chronic disease patients without giving away too much because I want people mm -hmm. here to see it but our people at home how can you do this and how is M Health Technologies helping you well it's, a, it's the hockey stick we're talking about beyond six months we have yep. to try and be smart we have to understand the patient's physiology. We have to understand the patient's psychology. So what we're trying to do is, for example, we call episodic monitoring. Minimal background monitoring with occasionally when our software detects some subtle changes, asking them to do a bit more. So, you know, you've got some apps where it would take five, ten minutes to do this every day. Uh -huh. No way that's going to happen. Right. So very short uh, adaptive diaries, in which may have very few questions. If we ask them to do any measurements, do it for a very short period of time. And then this is when the electrical engineers come in you extract the maximum amount of information out of that 30-second measurement. All the patch, I work with a company in the Bay Area, right. Proteus Digital Health, that do patches. Uh -huh. You can stick on for seven days. We do sleep studies. So we do sleep studies, and from the way the sleep patterns are being changed, you can infer a lot about the heart failure patient Absolutely. or the COPD patient. And one final thing. Yeah, tell us. Because our, um, our motto is maximal information at minimal cost to the patient. That's not monetary cost. That's the cost of doing these things right. in your daily timetable. So we have a kind of application we call, we can't call it this because we can't patent the name or trademark the health uh -huh. Skype. Basically, when they are Skyping their grandkids, right. it's a bit like the tricorder. We use the uh -huh. webcam from the uh, tablet or the yep. laptop, and we measure as much as we can. We measure the heart rate, the breathing rate, which other people have done. Where perhaps we're unique, we've done the oxygen levels as well. 
This is very cool. I, I got one more question for sure. you. All right. We wouldn't all be at this conference if we weren't champions in some way, you know, of wireless health. Let's talk about just really quickly, what do you think the future is? What, what's the biggest change over the next five years? What do you hope the biggest change is going to be in the next five years? Well, I think that the, the, the future is actually demonstrating the long-term monitoring does work. I think the short-term, uh, I think we have the data, the evidence yep. that we were talking about earlier. Long-term, it's about having clever sensors, clever software, and data fusion is very important. Now, it's not just what one sensor tells you, it's the combination yep. of the diary. It's even how long you take to answer the questions uh -huh. in your diary. There may only be two or three questions, but today, because you're not doing so well, the latency time is greater. It means a lot to you, right? Combine that information, combine that with the answer to the diary, combine with these occasional sensor right. measurement, use data fusion, and finally, uh, everybody's different. The algorithms have got to learn right. about each individual, each patient, and wow. then we have robust uh, wireless health. And once it becomes robust and delivers better patient outcomes, then I think everybody will sign up to it. Great. Before I let you go, Lionel, I'll ask every guest I've ever okay. had on the show this. What's your favorite app, and it does not have to be a healthcare app, that you like, that you can't live without these days? Well, um, the, the one that I, I personally like is, is about tracking the amount of um, – exercise I'm doing each day because we spend far too much time sitting. Which one? My Fitness Pal? What are you into? Which um, is the app? Well, actually, it's one that's developed by a colleague in the university, okay. so it's not um, oh, oh, a prepared. commercial one yet. Um, but it also allows me to answer some questions which remind me of what I should really be doing. That's great. Lionel, this was awesome. Thank, Thank you, you for being much. on the yes, show. Thank you for inviting me. Have a great me. rest of the show and a great trip back Thank over you. the pond. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much.